I'm David Nage, uh, principal at ARCA, formerly a family office investor, and I'm happy to be here today talking about DeFi and CeFi. And we'll just go down quickly uh, for 30 seconds and just introduce the panel, and then we'll go into some questions. If anyone has any questions, I like to make things interactive. This is not just about us talking to you. This is about you learning and also questioning and challenging things. So if you have questions, raise them up, and we'll try to get to them. So Kevin? Uh, thanks. So um, my name is Kevin. Um, I run Galois Capital, and we are an HFT and market making uh, fund. Hi there. My name is Sunaina. I'm the head of uh, digital assets. Sorry, to go to red eye. Uh, I am the head of digital assets and DLT at TD Ameritrade. If you don't know about TD Ameritrade, we're one of the largest um, trading firms in the United States and in Asia, with about 15 million retail clients and 7,000 advisors. Uh, thank you, David. Hey, everyone. I'm Nicholas. I lead research at Terra. Uh, and we are a decentralized stablecoin and payment network based out of Korea. And um, we've been growing really fast. So in, in our past, uh, in our first four months of operation, we already have half a million users. Awesome. So the first question, uh, as we have about 30 minutes, and I want to get a lot of information down here. So the first question I have, and we'll start with Kevin, we'll go down the, the lane. About a year ago, based off of uh, uh, DeFi uh, Pulse, we had about 212 million as a total value locked in DeFi. Today, we have about 608 million. So what, in your opinion, has caused an almost three times increase in a year? Yeah, you know, I think really it's just showing that there's some product market fit, um, that some of these folks, they do want to take out loans, um, they do want to collateralize their assets and take levered positions. And, uh, you know, I think overall it's a very uh, nice organic growth uh, that we see in that industry. So I think, you know, if you look at Ethereum, really what has come out of it that has product market fit, I would say pretty much you can make your own coin, you can gamble, and there's some DeFi projects. So I would say, you know, it's one of the more promising uh, subsectors uh, of the industry. Um, yeah, so uh, just to give you context, you know, the mandate of us building a crypto practice at TD Ameritrade is really, you know, one, one side of it is we build products and services for the clients that I mentioned earlier. We also make investments in the overall, you know, ecosystem. And the third is we spend a lot of time around advocacy and education. And just want to give you that context because it gives us a really fascinating bird's eye view of how this uh, ecosystem and community is evolving. So to your question, you know, three things I've noticed. One is, I think the last couple of years in a DeFi community were really heads down focused on kind of the fundamentals, you know, if you could say they were building the base layer, right, of, of that's his podcast. That's my podcast. <laughs> and you should Everyone listen should listen to that. <laughs> um, you know, suck up to the host time right now. So, you know, you know, so it was really focused on that and you're seeing kind of the, the output of all of that hard work and investment start to now sprout. Number two is, and this is the beauty of DeFi, right, like the under underlying fundamentals and building blocks are now allowing new developers and, you know, new operators to come build on top of it and tackle new use cases, which leads me to this. My third point, you know, part of my portfolio is also looking at blockchain as a technology, and I loathe blockchain theater, and I'm usually the one to say no to most of the projects because there's no real problem behind it. What I like about the DeFi community is they're actually going after utility. They are solving for things that our points of friction, as Kevin mentioned. So I think we're starting to see that, um, you know, adoption. Now there's a long way to go, but I think those, the confluence of those three things is help gener help, helping to generate some of those results. Nick? Thanks, Nina. Um, I think all those are interesting points. Uh, I think I'll take a slightly less uh, optimistic view. So I think Kevin is very right that, um, you know, as the space has uh, expanded as more and more people have realized on the lender side that you know you can basically make some passive interest on your crypto for whales and people who by default will hold a lot of crypto being able to get some cash flow out of that is of course uh, positive so the fact that you have protocols like compound maker and so on that let you do that i think is interesting uh, but that's it i think that the what we still haven't seen is people actually using DeFi in their everyday lives to, to you know, actually have, uh, you know, in use cases that are not specifically crypto focused, right? So especially in the um, borrower side, the fact that you have to basically uh, over collateralize your loans, I think restricts um, the, uh, 
uh, usage of DeFi at this point to the crypto space, right? It's ma mainly used for uh, margin trading, and I think the space needs to figure out better solutions, uh, you know, to make adoption of DeFi broader beyond, you know, on the lender side, uh, just getting some passive interest, and then the borrow side, basically margin, margin trading, right? I always like to think of my aunt in Jacksonville, Florida, who doesn't know anything about technology. She knows how to use email. She knows how to text message, but she doesn't know anything else besides that. What would actually get her to use something like this? And so, yes, I think what we've seen, just so I can answer the question too, is that I think we've seen the Ethereum community and those that have actually already participated in Ethereum get involved in these tools, get involved in Uniswap, things of that nature, use Compound and Dharma, which are quite easy to use these days. But at the end of the day, that's been internal. That's been just in the sandbox. And to Kevin's point and Sinead's point, um, you know, there really has not been this expansion outside of the, the box, where people, the 55 million in the United States that are underbanked are now using DeFi products. The 1.6 billion people throughout the world that are underbanked are using DeFi products. And so I think once we get to that point, if we do get to that point, that number will exponentially grow. But right now, I think what we're starting to see is that the tooling, the lending, the derivatives, there's a lot of interest to actually start using your crypto. And I think that's been a mantra that's been happening throughout the system. And I think that's what we're seeing with the 3x return. But obviously, if those tools get to be easier and less frictionless, um, then we start to see those underbanked potentially using it too. So. Moving to the next question, um, what we've started to kind of think about is this panel is about C5 versus D5. So what learnings, if any, from observations about C5, centralized finance, can you transition to D5, if any? What have we learned from either the things we've done right or the things that we have not done right in C5 that we can now apply to D5? I think there's actually quite a few learnings. I mean, I think the first is that there's a good reason why the financial sector developed the, the way that it was uh, developed. And, you know, in the beginning, um, organically, there were no, you know, clearing houses even in centralized finance. But for some reason or other, they realized, wait a second, it actually makes a lot of sense to have a central clearing e entity, you know, makes sense to have, you know, exchanges service brokers and then brokers service retail. You know, there, these hub and spoke models developed organically. And I think in many ways, we're kind of relearning um, the lessons that we've you know, kind of already learned uh, in the past in, uh, you know, in the development of traditional finance. Um, I think, you know, one of the other things that I think is, is a very big takeaway and also very relevant to today and the DeFi ecosystem today is that liquidity is very important, you know? And if you look at any new kind of liquidity pool, like an ECN uh, or some kind of like multi-dealer or single-dealer platform in the traditional space, um, whenever there were already incumbents, um, these new challengers would get buy-in from a lot of the big banks, a lot of the big prop shops, you know, that sort of thing, because it's very hard to kind of jumpstart liquidity, right? I mean, makers go to where takers are, takers go to where makers are. So now that DeFi is coming along uh, in crypto after CeFi, and they have incumbents to battle, I mean, you know, the DeFi projects are not just competing with each other, they also have to compete against, you know, Coinbase, they have to compete against Binance, on, you know, um, for on the lending side, Genesis Capital. So there's a lot of competition. There's this entrenched kind of, um, you know, this, these, these entrenched incumbents. Now to do battle with them, I think you need to get a lot of buy-in from market makers, from liquidity providers, to then either clone over liquidity or provide natural organic liquidity uh, onto, these, onto these protocols. And I think that's something that, um, you know, maybe the DeFi guys can take a, a lesson out of the, you know, old playbook in traditional finance. So Nana? Yeah, I ag agree with a lot of it. And by the way, I'm Canadian, so I'm optimist by default, so, but, but I'm, I'm glad you mentioned the other side of it. <laughs> um, but no, I, I'll double click on what Kevin said, because I think that was a good start. You know, uh, I think scalability, which I know we talk at, you know, ad nauseum, but scalability from a perspective of infrastructure, which you touched on, but I think also from, a, from the, the lens of security, right? I think one of the things that the C5 community or organizations have had to focus on either by design or because they've been forced to um, is really put a lot of muscle and resources behind, you know, um, the, 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 the security of their information and, you know, their, their platforms, et cetera. Um, because ultimately, like, like, listen, with TD Ameritrade, yes, we do a lot of 
awesome things, but at the un end of the day, we're in the trust business, right? You've trusted us with your life's uh, savings and you know nothing else matters other than you knowing that you will have access to it when you want it. So I think those elements from an infrastructure uh, and scalability component. I think the other thing is also um, you know, when I meet with our DeFi portfolio companies or as we're evaluating investments, one of the things I struggle with is what is the, um, um, you know, what's the litmus test, litmus test from a measurement perspective, right? Everybody's kind of measuring their own things in their own ways. So how do I compare project A, project B, project C? So I think that's, again, something we can learn from C5. By no means is it perfect, but having that standard set of metrics. Um, and again, I think metrics are also important because what gets measured gets done at the end of the day. So I would say maybe two, do two of those things. Interesting. Yeah, I agree with, uh, with many of those points and certainly agree that um, if you can't measure it, then you can't improve it. It's definitely a Silicon Valley mantra that uh, I think has been proven uh, again and again. So to add a couple of uh, things that I, fundamental, I would say, uh, problems that DeFi needs to overcome in order to become competitive with centralized finance. By the way, I had never heard of C5 before I was invited to this panel. So. <laughs> Neither have I. Well, that, was, that was an interesting one. Um, yeah, so I would say the first is um, the fact that in decentralized finance, because most of those protocols are pseudonymous, you lack identity, and therefore you lack any notion of a credit score. Right? And I think this is something that in one way or another needs to be improved, because because basically because of that, you need to over collateralize your loans uh, and therefore the cost of capital is, I would say for most uh, everyday use cases, uh, completely prohibitive, right? So when you take a loan, let's say you're a business, uh, you wanna start a new business, or you wanna take a loan, the entire point of borrowing is to have net positive liquidity, right? So if you need to lock up $150 to borrow $100, then that immediately restricts you to a very narrow set of use cases, so I think uh, DeFi needs to c come up with more creative solutions to circumvent the fact that those protocols are pseudonymous and therefore you don't have a credit score. Uh, there is no perfect solution and I think you, we need to be creative um, in terms of you know, potentially coming up with reputation systems, coming up with intelligent mechanisms that penalize you for being dishonest and it's a very tricky problem but I think that unless this is solved, decentralized lending will only make sense for a very narrow uh, set of use cases. Uh, so that's the first. And then the second key disadvantage that I think that DeFi has relative to centralized finance and traditional uh, credit and lending is the fact that uh, the reason why banks are able to you know, lend to so many people and uh, typically are able to offer quite competitive interest rates is the fact that risk is pooled, right? So risk pooling is one of the essential pieces of the financial system and it goes from insurance to credit to pretty much every, um, every large institution uses risk pooling to be more efficient uh, in the way it, uh, it does finance. And I think if you look at the protocols today, uh, it, in most cases you just have a single asset, say for Maker it's just Ethereum. So uh, you know, basically every single loan outstanding has correlation one, right? If Ethereum tanks, then all those loans go bust. And again, I think that makes this fundamentally um, inefficient, right? Uh, so again, we need a way to uh, introduce some notion of uh, on correlation or ne either uh, low or negative correlation uh, to improve this. Can I add another one at the risk Absolutely. of getting booed off stage? <laughs> um, I'm gonna say the R word around regulation. I know this is decentralized finance and you know, so, so bear with me here. I, I'm going somewhere with this. I think, the, the, we have global reach with DeFi and we're doing things that are interesting and we're doing things that are novel and whether we like it or not, the regulators are going to start thinking about it because at the end of the day, you're catering to the consumer. Number one responsibility for a regulator is consumer protection. They don't care if it's built on CFI, DeFi, or anything in between. So I just think the other thing that we can learn from the CFI community, and I'm not saying that you know we start hiring lobbyists or anything, but is I think more proactive education and advocacy, right? Going back to your point is we don't think of how when I send you an email, all the stuff that has to happen in the background, when that catalyzing event or events happen, and mainstream consumers start to adopt this, 
they're going to need to understand what they're getting into. And I'm sorry, but the next wave of consumers, if they're not the enthusiasts, they're not the ones that are inclined to read white papers or nerd out on crypto Twitter. They're going to want something much more simplified, and that's what's going to drive adoption. And I think that extends to the regulators as well. So I think proactive education and engagement and advocacy is something that will serve us in the long term. That's Don't boo at me. Yeah, I was going to say that, you know, having lived through 07 and 08, 09, having to see Bear Stearns completely turn down, seeing Lehman blow up, wondering if I was going to have a job the next day, really kind of solidifies something in your mind about systemic risk. And so I think one thing that DeFi really needs to take to heart is the systemic risk that is being created by collateralizing with Ethereum and some of the other digital assets out there. As you know, DAI is now moving to multi-collateral DAI, I think we're starting to create some of these things that could get, unfortunately, a little bit more complex you know, and more dangerous, dare I say. And so I think they really need to take a page from what we've learned from the mistakes that were made and then apply them to uh, that going forward. And I know many are. There are capital controls and there's governance involved in many of these different projects out there in DeFi. Um, but I definitely think they need to take it um, a little bit more uh, to heart. So I think moving forward, that gets us to the next question. So in a recent article from Bloomberg, I think it came out about a day or two ago, titled, Another Credit Bubble Grows, the $5 billion crypto loan market. There's a quote I want you all to address, either you know if you believe it or counter it. So the crypto market is still a small market relative to traditional asset classes. However, the feeling of deja vu is there. Lack of regulation, cheap credit available with minimal due diligence, and broad optimism. Uh, this was from uh, someone uh, that stated that recently. And so I'm curious, you know, Kevin, in terms of you know, this kind of idea of a crypto bubble, you know, a crypto credit bubble, um, and this lack of due diligence. From the, you, what you've seen in DeFi and some of those projects and talking to some of those, do you agree with this? Yeah, you, you know what's funny is I actually know who said that. It's uh, one of my good friends, Matthew, who works at uh, Coinlist, and we actually take borrows from them. Um, you know, in, in many ways, I agree uh, in the sense that there is a bubble, I think, in, in the borrow space. Um, but I, I don't think it's that risky yet. And I think it really just comes down to how much is the um, is the uh, collateral rehypothecated. You know, if you rehypothecate it maybe like two or three times, that's pretty safe. I mean, if you rehypothecate it like 10 times, you know, now that's getting a little bit dangerous, especially given how much correlation, um, like, you know, all of us have mentioned about, you know, um, you know, all of these different assets. So I think, um, you know, because it's over collateralized, it's bad for the balance sheet. You get, you, you know, you contract your balance sheet, you don't get any balance sheet extension. Um, it doesn't serve that purpose, but at least I think it's fairly safe um, when liquidations do need to happen. So as long as rehypothecation ratios are reasonable, I think, I think that's okay. And I just wanted to sort of echo one last point about um, the last thing that you talked about, David, which is that, you know, there's all sorts of this kind of systemic risk. And it's not just, I think, rehypothecation. I think it's also, you know, stuff like, with multi-collateral die, what if I was, you know, first of all, all of these assets that are ERC-20 tokens are probably you know, fairly correlated with each other. And the second is that what if I have like a super illiquid asset and there's no way for me to get out of that position, um, you know, slippage is going to be ridiculous, like 25%, 30%. Maybe I just, you know, use that as, that as collateral um, to open a CDP and then just walk away from it, knowing that, yeah, I'm going to pay some penalties, I'm going to get liquidated, uh, whatnot. But in a way, it's a cheap way for me to exit out of a super liquid position on you know something that trades only like a million bucks every day, right? So I think there's a lot of game theory and mechanism design that needs to be thought out that these things cannot be exploited. And when you add more and more assets and more and more complexity um, to the model or to the mechanism, um, it gets harder and harder to think about all of the edge cases and all the possible exploits that could happen. Um, so that, those are my thoughts. Uh, well, I agree with most of this, though. To be honest, the quote didn't make any sense to me because, number one, credit is definitely not cheap. Uh, like, if you compare interest rates to, you know, what you would get traditionally, they tend to be much higher. And also, the reason why we don't have due diligence is because you can't do due diligence, right? It's all pseudonymous. And that's why you have to over-collateralize. So, yeah, in that sense, I think that, uh, yeah, th that criticism, at least to me, doesn't make too much sense. Uh, and also, echoing what Kevin said, I think in terms of systemic risk, uh, I think we're very far from anything that could look like that. I mean, if you look at the total market cap of cryptocurrencies, they're a fourth, a fifth of what Apple is worth. I'm sure Apple is the 
most valuable company in the world, but we're looking at a single company, right? So, um, yeah, I think that the size of this space at the moment is absolutely minuscule uh, compared to the global financial system. Uh, regulators, I think, are getting very scared with the prospect of projects like Libra that could touch billions of people. Uh, but at the moment, I think, um, yeah, crypto is basically a, a grain of sand in, uh, in the financial in global financial system. Mm -hmm. I, I would completely agree with what's been stated. I think if I put on my lens of, again, who am I serving? You know, 12 million retail clients and a large swat of them are not the enthusiasts probably. They're more the curious and gonna be the second, third, fourth, 10th wave of adopters. And you know, the, the thing about that statement that struck me was it was actually kind of a bit of a, they were kind of arguing from both sides. One is, it's a little bit of shade, it's so little. You're right, the overall size of the crypto market is like, let's say 300 billion in a good, on a good day. Well, Apple's got more cash sitting in a bank account somewhere, right? So I think that, you know, that, that's, that's a humbling, you know, perspective for all of us. But then on the second hand, it's like, oh, it's so small, but oh, it's gonna blow up. So it's like, I, I, I was kind of trying to digest the point as well. I, I think the thing I would say is, you know, I don't think anybody's saying we're going to get everything we do in D5 perfect every single time. We are going to have bumps in the road. We're gonna scrape our knees. Like, you know, things aren't always gonna manifest the way their plan, just like C5 isn't exactly perfect. Like I started my career after the world was melting in investment banking, like the C5 of C5. So, you know, there's a lot that I, you know, one of the things that excites me about DeFi is there's a lot of things we're doing in a new way uh, with automation and, you know, just the way we're building the new infrastructure that I think we can port back to centralized capital markets because they're not exactly perfect and I think they need to be modernized and kind of be more progressive. So I know I'm kind of getting away from the quote, but um, I think both sides can learn. And I think, you know, in terms of the way I think about it, you know, we talk about the size and the overall ecosystem about 250, 260 billion as of today. Um, and this is something I've been talking a lot about, whether on panels or on my podcast, is that we must, everyone in this room has to go out and talk to people that are not in this ecosystem currently. And we have to talk to them about, you know, whether it's DeFi products, whether it's Bitcoin, whatever you really, you know, know about that you feel solidly about, that you feel passionately about. We have to start broadening the base. We cannot continue to, you know, go to these wonderful conferences and talk amongst ourselves. We need to go outside of these walls and bring more people into the system. Um, and so to the point that, you know, it is still a very small system and the systemic risk is not that great. It is great because right now this, this whole ecosystem is being on the shoulders of just the few of us out here. And you know, if any of us get hurt that badly, it could obviously cause an evaporation, which obviously we don't want to see happen. So you know, one thing, we must all go out and talk to people that are not in the system currently right now. It is sometimes uncomfortable, it is sometimes a little awkward, but we have to do that. It is on each of, um, each of us that are in the system right now that are investors in these things uh, and that are builders of these different projects to do that. And so the last question I have, and then obviously if you guys have questions, as I said, please, we want to make this interactive as possible. So if you have questions, don't be shy. I know it's a little awkward sometimes to ask a question in a dark room, uh, but do it because that's the way that we all learn. Um, in terms of the entire ecosystem of DeFi, whether it's loans, whether it's DEXs, whether it's the derivatives and the synthetics that we're seeing right now, what aspect, if any of them, is really getting you excited and why? You know, I, I think there's a lot of um, talk about composability and the fact that some of these contracts can call each other. Um, I think that's interesting. Um, but overall, I think, you know, what's really interesting is what can we actually do with DeFi that we can't with CeFi? Well, there's only a, really a few things. One is that it's, you know, more censorship resistant. Maybe there's something that really benefits from that. Um, you know, another is uh, maybe there's more privacy. You know, you can be pseudo-anonymous. Um, so maybe there's something that can really benefit from that. So far, though, I would say, um, you know, I don't, you know, if we're, if, you know, for my firm, we don't really care, right? Like, if we if we take a borrow from Genesis or we take a borrow from Compound, it doesn't really matter so much. It's just how much collateral do we need to post and what are the interest rates, right? It doesn't, re the, me the mechanism behind it, whether it's CFAR, DeFi, doesn't really matter. So I think... Um, for DeFi to really take off, 
we have to figure out what aspects of decentralization are being fully actualized and put to use and benefited from um, you know, in these, in these you know, killer apps, rather than just something that's kind of cloning what we already have in CFI and then just directly competing with them on rates. So, um, so that's my thought. And I haven't, I haven't really seen that yet. You've seen, you, you know, you're, we're starting to scratch the surface a little bit with these like automated market makers um, on Uniswap, you know, that sort of thing. It's a little bit, you know, different. Um, but I want to see more different things, you know, not a lot of the same things and then just, you know, competing against these giant incumbents, yeah. Uh, actually, I'll make a point on something you said, David, and come back um, to this, is I 100% agree, not to get all Ayn Rand on everybody, but I think personal responsibility of all of us who are in the ecosystem is so critical um, because consumers are reading all kinds of stories about, we talk about mainstream consumers, right? My mom reads all kinds of stories about you know crypto and its variation. But the more stories she reads that are positive, good behavior, success stories, the more it breeds confidence and, you know, versus, and, and I think that again applies to regulators who I love and adore and work with them very well, but, you know, but I think that good behavior and onboarding people through storytelling is very critical. Um, again, bringing it back to the question you were asking for, I think, um, I, don't, I don't have a pick to make. I think they're all important. I know that's a cop-out answer. I kind of go back to the fundamental point, which is I think anybody who's working to help make D5 products that are solving problems that C5 hasn't solved or not solved well enough, as Kevin said, and I think that also ties to usability. I think unless the usability is simple, fast, easy, I don't have to worry about what's happening in the background, I don't need to ten, read 10 white papers or any of that stuff to understand, I think that is going to be the sweet spot that helps with scale, um, but I think it'll be a confluence of all of this different work coming together. Nick? I think this makes sense. Um, I think I'll be a bit more boring here, and I'll say that uh, in my opinion, the segment of DeFi that I think has the best shot at getting broad adoption uh, at the moment is payments. Uh, so f for the reasons we mentioned before, I think there are fundamental disadvantages that uh, DeFi lending or DeFi derivatives have compared to the traditional alternatives. Um, and so I think they, the value proposition they offer is quite niche. Uh, into a very specific set of people, right? Mostly within crypto, you know, if you have a bunch of Ethereum and you want to take a loan on that, um, but, you know, the ap applicability, I think, is very narrow. On the contrary, what I would say is payments, uh, and I'm mildly biased here, uh, is uh, the use case where pretty much for everyone with a smartphone, uh, you have fundamental advantages relative to the traditional system, right? So I think Terra is a very good use case here. Uh, the two ways in which I think about the value proposition are towards the merchant and towards the consumer. So Terra is e-commerce focused for the time being. And I think on, on both ends, you have pretty clear advantages. Merchant, um, the fact that you were able to charge some lower fees than what Visa, MasterCard, and so on take is a big advantage. So it, you know, we use a, a Terra, we use a tenderment based blockchain and we can save 90 plus percent. Uh, of the fees that e-commerce companies pay uh, to Visa and MasterCard. And side note here, to put this in context, uh, the net margins of e-commerce companies are extremely thin. So this, this happens across the world, and I think in Asia even more so. Uh, we're looking at you know, 7 to 8% net margins. So if 2 to 3% of that goes to Visa, that is a massive hole in their balance sheet. Right? So being able to save a substantial fraction of that is very um, significant. Uh, and then... The second piece of this equation are the users. And I think that if you're creative with the way you structure your economy, then you're able to offer significant value proposition there as well. And the way Terra does this is we reinvest part of the growth in the economy when essentially demand for Terra grows. So for quick context, Terra is a stable coin, right? And uh, the way we keep its price stable is we uh, expand and contract supply to make sure that the price remains at the peg. And so there, the idea is that as demand for Terra grows, you have to issue more Terra, and part of that is given back to users in the form of promotions, in the form of discounts. And as such, we've been able to offer significant discounts on the order, on the order of 5 to 10%. Um, and you can think about this sort of conceptually as the equivalent of fiscal spending, right? So a government does fiscal spending in order to boost the economy and in, in order to increase money demand. And that's sort of the, the idea that we apply at Terra. And this is an example where 
in a payments application, if you do intelligent token economics, uh, you can offer fundamental value proposition to the user, which is very hard to do traditionally, right? So traditional payment companies have to burn, to, to do something like this, they have to burn money off their balance sheet, right? They have to sell equity to investors in order to uh, make the payment uh, more competitive. And so with Terra, we can do this in a decentralized way. So we have about a minute and a half left. As I said, I want to you know open it up. If anyone has a question about DeFi versus CFI, you know, please, you know, don't be shy. Again, oh, there we go. Just without microphone. Yeah, sure. Uh, so I I have this uh, friend, and he uh, he doesn't like banks or anything having to do with CFI, right? And uh, so when I talked to him about uh, crypto economy ideas. Uh, First, he was a bit, you know, holding it off. And after a while, 15 minutes, he was interested. And the reason he was interested was, well, okay, so I don't have all this hassle with having to have my picture taken, putting my fingerprints down. Basically, the whole KYC process was basically a hassle to him. So he didn't like it. And I said, no, you can just open a, an account using a seed, and then that's it. You know? So it took him a little while to wrap his head around it. But after that, he was very enthusiastic, and he actually was starting to tell others to do this as well. And... Um, so the funny thing is, it wasn't even a killer app from a user perspective. It was just the fact that it was explained to him. And it was, he was educated. Right. That got him interested. And then he also started doing things he would never have done in CFI, like um, you know, trying to test things out with lending, trying a little bit of trading, and you know, things he would have wanted to do but didn't want to do because of all the hassle. So how do you look at this in the context of the uh, scaling of, of, C of, of DeFi? So the question is, how do you actually, you know, work in terms of scaling from, you know, what we would see from, you know, DeFi from CFI to DeFi, basically? How do you actually, when it comes to new users? To new users. To okay. Sounds like the dream user to me. Yeah. Right? <laughs> I, I think you kind of actually touched on something: education. I s fundamentally believe education is a silver bullet, but education delivered in a way that's kitchen English without all the buzziness. And then ultimately, you're right. Different people are going to come into it for different reasons. Some will come in for the killer app, some for the utilities, some for, you know, more of that, I want to control my data, control my privacy, but, and I think we default for all of that, but it's how are we storytelling and explaining it. Great. Thank you to the panel, and thank you all. We really appreciate it. Thank, thank you, you all. Thank you. Thanks.